Okay. Good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's better. So, did you enjoy the Bon Jovi concert yesterday? Um, I wasn't there, so I just had to ask. Preparing for the demos today. We have a lot of demos to show you. So, welcome to this session about building adaptive companion apps for devices using SharePoint 2013. My name is Rune Sakariasen. Uh, I'm a program manager in Information Experiences Group in Microsoft SharePoint. And I have Manfred with me. Yep, my name is Manfred Perry. I'm a senior dev lead in uh, the same group. And I've been working with the uh, REST interface as part of my work in, in 13. That's true. So, um, how many attended my uh, architect, search architecture session on, um, on Monday? Okay. So, I, I hope you enjoy it. It's a little bit more airy here now than it was in that session. It was a little bit crowded. I got a lot of feed, feedback or heat for that uh, afterwards. But I hope you will enjoy uh, this room. Um, this is a developer session. So, in case you're not a developer, now you're one. We will show you live code here. We're going to develop applications, or at least one application, for Surface RT. Um, we will, technically, this, this session is about the search API. So it's all about search. But the scenario we are talking about is much more than that. So um, we have picked one scenario, building companion applications, and we'll explain what that is for you, um, for a website that already exists in SharePoint. But just imagine, take a step back. This is just one of many scenarios you can use these interfaces for, these APIs for. You can integrate with line of business application. You can hook up to your existing web front end investments. There is basically no limit to how we can use this API. And um, it has a lot of power. I mean, we'll only explore a, some part of it today. So let's show you what we are going to talk about today. So the search REST APIs. It's more than one. It's actually a couple of companion APIs that goes with the REST API we will talk to you about. And then we are going to develop adaptive companion apps. So let's, let's explain what adaptive really means. Uh, I guess you have seen it a lot, adaptive or search-driven, which is what it is about. It's about creating user interfaces that adapts to what the user is doing, trying to create more compelling user experiences. So that's the adaptive part. So companion, it's about having additional applications or apps for devices that goes with your SharePoint sites. Could be public-facing sites, as we have chosen today, the scenario today, but it can also be internal sites or line of business applications. Um, important it is to reuse the content and navigation across the channels and devices. So if you have an existing SharePoint site, um, we would like to reuse that, tap into that, and ex extract that information and content and use that in, in uh, our device applications. And lastly, we would like to really tap into the power of search. And I hope you are starting to believe in the power of search by now. You will see in a lot of sessions, I hope, on search, um, to, to utilize promotions and recommendations in, devi in device applications, something we call editorial control. Um, so let's go straight to it and give you the first demo. We'll start a little bit light here. We will show you an existing web storefront. It should be familiar to you by now. And afterwards, we will see how a companion app could look like. So this is Contoso Electronics Superstore. I hope you have seen it by now. And there is a couple of sessions um, uh, at this conference that shows you how to build this site. And this site is totally driven by search. On the front page here, uh, I would like you to pay attention to the navigation. This is what we call managed navigation, which is maintained in uh, the taxonomy term store. Um, at the bottom of the first page, we have favorites or po most popular items, again also driven by, by search. Let's go into one of the categories, cameras. And here we basically get a lot of products in this application or this scenario. And everything here is basically a search result. And on the left side, we can tap into that, something that you might be familiar with from Search Center in SharePoint 2010, contextual refiners. Depending on what you have in your search results, we can help you navigate to what you would like to see. And of course, more search results, and we can go into an item itself, 
And as you might also have learned in older sessions, we support variances and with a product. Also, we have recommendations, interesting items that other users have bought together with this item. Now, imagine how could a compiling app on a portable device, we have chosen Surface RT for this session, but it could be any device. What could that look like? So, Manfred, can, why don't you show us? Yes, it's a pleasure. So, I'm using here my, my RT device to show you, you see it on the screen, what's actually displaying there. We have been doing, or try, sorry. connectivity issues, give me a second, please. Oh, there you go. Yeah, now it comes. So I, I put it down so we have a little bit more stable here. So <clears throat> what, what we will do now in this session is to develop an app which uses all the investments which we have made in our website and use the same content on our devices again. We have been using RT as an example here. Everything which I'm going to show you here today is also doable on any other device which actually supports REST. So you can, you can use uh, Android, iOS, whatever you like. Runa is going a, little, uh, going a little, bit, little bit deeper into the REST API afterwards. <clears throat> What's cool about using a device is you can really tap into the, the device capabilities. You can make a very touchable user interface. So if I show you the same as Runa has done, we can go into a category. For example, let's go into the computers here. You will see we have on the left side, we have the facets again. The facets are completely driven from our website again. So you see the same facets, the same names on, on our device again. You can then <clears throat> make a little bit more visually attractive. For example, you have the items here. We can, for example, just buy a, a laptop for my wife, which she likes the red one. And because I'm a cheap guy, I'm going for the cheap one. And maybe it's just because she needs it for surfing. Then you can, of course, do very cool stuff like uh, build comparison of uh, devices like that. And that's really easier to do on, on companion apps, and I think it broadens your, your exposure of your site. Good. Super. So that's what we're going to build today. Yep. That's what it is. Sounds good? OK, so let's take a, a step back and, and look at uh, a couple of things we saw here. Now, everything is powered by search from SharePoint 2013. And all the content is, well, it doesn't have to be in SharePoint 2013, as we can't crawl content from other places. Uh, but it certainly helps, at least in, the, in this scenario where we have the product catalog that, can, that helps you um, drive this managed navigation so you can pay attention to your content, your taxonomy, uh, and build up your, uh, your managed navigation properties. Um, and of course, with that, you get the web server that SharePoint 2013 brings with it, and you can um, show that user interface, build sites that show up on, in web browsers. Now, we are going to do the native part here, and you can see the REST API basically sits just directly on top of the, the search service and gives you all these capabilities. So anything you basically can do within SharePoint, you can do through this, this API. This API is really, really, really important. I mean, the, the client-side object model, the REST and all data, what we call the new endpoint, client-side object model for SharePoint 2013. It's more than just about creating device applications, really, because this is the, the endpoint that makes it possible to create applications that can span SharePoint installations, both on-premises and in the cloud. So it's basically a cloud application model. Um, so as you know, maybe CSOM, or client-side object model from SharePoint 2010, comes with, with some client libraries that you have to hook into in order to tap into its power. We have the JavaScript, Civilite, and .NET libraries. But what if you are on a device or a platform that does not so support any of this? Then comes the REST APIs into play. Now, most of these REST APIs for SharePoint in 2013 <coughs> is all data-based. And search is a little bit different than that. And that is actually by intention. So normally, when you go to an all data API, or uh, in, in SharePoint 2013, you get back Atom feeds. We have chosen to actually natively send you back the complex types directly. And the reason for that is because we intended these API to be used um, with implicit navigation, implicitly uh, driving the user experience um, on your client. And then it needs to be fast. So we take away all this extra overhead of the Atom feeds and, and give you the data directly. 
Now, how many of you have played with um, SharePoint 2013 from beta 2? Okay, a couple. So there is one change we made from beta 2 till the, uh, to the RTM release, and that is that the search API for any public facing site that is open for anonymous, um, in beta 2, the, the search API was also uh, open. Now it's not. Uh, we have taken that away, so it's protected by default. In order to open that up, you basically have to create a template file that you put in a certain document library, uh, query properties template. And this template file um, explains to SharePoint exactly what of the search parameters do, would you like to open up for anonymous users and what kind of default values do you want them to have. And in addition to that, you have to uh, use that in uh, the REST calls to, to SharePoint to tell SharePoint which template file you would like to utilize um, to, to get it to respond. If, if you don't have this, um, the API will be closed down. So let's demo that a little bit as well. So here I have a REST call on top of here to really prove it's, it's REST, HTTP GET. So we go to the same site and we decorate it with underscore API and search query. And then we can add any of the, I think it's 25 or 30 different search parameters. This is a really powerful uh, API. We'll, we'll just use a couple of these properties now or, or parameters now. So basically we are searching for uh, any item with M400 in it. And then I add this query template that I already created. And then I get back search results. And here we go. So what you get back here is search result, which is a, a structure uh, with, a, with several attributes and properties. So what I would like you to pay attention to is the primary query results. This is where you basically get the main results from the query back to you. Inside here, we have a couple of subtables. We have custom results, which can hold search results from uh, typically federated uh, searches <coughs> on, um, uh, on uh, open search. I mean, you can search across Bing as well with this. Um, refinement results, which give us all the contextual refiners. And in this case, I didn't ask for that, so I only got the relevant results. And this is where I get all my search hits. It contains a row count, so you can see how many hits we have. We have three in this case, and you can also see total rows in total. So basically, that's what I have in, in, from this uh, uh, search result in the index. Uh, and I can also see how many I have, including duplicates. This is actually how many items is in the index that we have removed the duplicates in this case. Going into the table, you can see the three elements. And here you have all the managed properties for each of the hits. So it's basically key value pairs, and it gives you all data typing. So you can parse this. And, and typecast to what you need in your clients. I also have another REST call here, down at the bottom of the page. And the only thing I did here is just I added the refiners. So these are the same refiner names that you, uh, that you would set up in, in your uh, taxonomy term store, uh, uh, price and color in this case. And when I get the search results back here, Basically, the primary query results will contain both relevant results, minimum three hits, and the refiners. And the refiner is basically a hierarchy of color and, let's see, price. And prices, I have already made buckets. So this is based on what I have in the search results. It, shouldn't, it should just be a few of them here. So you can see in a bucket here, less than... 199, I have four items in, in the product catalog. So this is what you get back. So what you're going to do is take this data and create this application. Let's switch back again. Yes, so let's come back to the app. Basically, what we really want to show you today is how to build app with what Runa showed you before. <clears throat> if you look at the app on the right side, and if I'm coughing, really sorry, I got a cold. Uh, here in, in Las Vegas, which is funny because I'm, I'm from Norway. <clears throat> so I should be used to actually have a, have a little bit fresh. So if I'm coughing, please, sorry about that. Uh, if you see on the right side, we have the SharePoint, we have the API, and on the left side, we have a component called WinRT Search Client. 
this client uh, will be available for download for your help uh, as an example pretty soon. This is really just the part which uh, builds up the REST query, uh, does, does the REST request, and does the deserialization into an object model. So it's easier to work against an object model. Uh, we will ship that for, for WinRT and, and some other .NET libraries. If you use iOS or, for example, in iOS 5, you have the, the JSON dynamic uh, provider, I think it's called, something like that. You can also use that to do pretty much the same pretty easily. So we will not look too much into that. I will show you a little bit code about it, but that's not that interesting. Then we have the search service. That's the part we're going to write today. So we are going to build up the queries which we use for our companion apps. And we will show how, you, how navigation works together with, with search, how you do analytic search, and how you do, uh, what's the last, last one? Uh, sorry, editorial control. So basically getting query rules into our apps as well. Yeah, that's correct. And then on the left side, that's really all WinRT specific. We're also not going to look into that. We are not a WinRT session here. That's really just managing the data, make it bind bindable to the SAML uh, and all the stuff behind it. So I have to use this one. So that's what we are going to show today. The app itself, you will be able to download, not directly after the session, but we will post uh, a link to the downloadable code uh, on, our, on our tag from the session. Good, I already mentioned we are first going to integrate with the SharePoint navigation. We want to get the navigation out of SharePoint to display our navigation, navigation in our app. Then we want to do a product category search, basically just get the, the item back on a certain category. If we navigate into laptops, for example, we only want to get laptops but we also want to have the whole navigation available on our, on our device. Then we are showing two examples on how you can use analy analytics. We are going to show most popular and item-to-item -item recommendations. Uh, that's a huge area, and these are really just two, two examples to explore everything you have to attend uh, another session. I don't have the name, but it's, in, it's on the end of the slides. Yeah, it's at the end of the slide deck. Yeah. And then we are going to uh, use usage events. So basically, if you want to use analytics and you also want to uh, give feedback to your analytics engine, you have to send log events. So you have to basically stream the analytics engine. And then uh, we're going into editorial control. Everything we're going to do today is using get, except uh, the usage events. But if you, if you have a very long uh, REST string and you are running out of, of, uh, of your HTTP uh, request string size, we also support post on all of these uh, methods. And the last bit is basically uh, tapping into editorial control. Good, let's start with the uh, navigation. <clears throat> so we are, we, what we want to do is basically get the man, man, navigation out of SharePoint. And in, in case of a search-driven site, it's called managed navigation. Navigation is driven by a term store. And on the left side, you see the same navigation as it's displayed on the screen. To get out the navigation, there is an endpoint called menu state. And we have to give him the uh, map provider name as a parameter. And you have to spe specify which pro uh, navigation provider in SharePoint you are actually, or, or which uh, navigation provider is used in SharePoint. In case of a search driven site, it's, o it's always the global uh, navigation switchable provider. Right, so then we want to get the same navigation in our app as you see below. If we do that, you will get uh, <clears throat> an XML back again, which Rune has shown you that the rest before. This one, this one is a small snippet of uh, navigation REST uh, response. So what you see, you have, you have the category, you have uh, keys in it, and I'm coming back to what, what we're using them for. And yeah, that's really it. So I think we, we just switch to the demo and show you how to do that in code. Let me switch now. Oh, actually, switch to seven first. So I started now the app with a blank page. So basically, I, I compiled it while Rene was talking in with basically nothing on, the, on this app. So you see it's completely empty right now. And that's the code we are going to work on right now. Number three. So here you see we have the, the SharePoint uh, search service, which I uh, was mentioning before. 
<clears throat> and in our application for a demo, we right now just uh, return an empty or a, a dummy task. We wait 500 milliseconds and return. So basically, we don't get anything back. So we're going to replace that now with some, some more interesting code. Stop here. Can you see it on the screen, or shall I zoom it in? Is it OK? Good? Yep. <clears throat> Good. What you see now is we are using this uh, client library, which I mentioned before, which you can download afterwards. Let's go into that and just see what that is really doing. It's really not doing a lot. It's building up the, the REST request. So we have the menu state as an endpoint. <clears throat> Depending on the properties we pass in, he, he sets the parameters. We are doing some caching, uh, which is always good if you have a client app, because uh, the network latency is it, it's good to cache it locally. And then if we don't have it in the cache, we basically set up the HTTP web request. We send the request. We use uh, deflate and zip if, if it's available. And then we, we do a deserialization on the screen into an object model. So that's really all which is going on here, just to, to see that I'm not cheating here. So <clears throat> what we do now is basically uh, call the, taking that out as well. We are calling this endpoint with this uh, switchable provider, as, as called, uh, mentioned before. Uh, the depth we actually don't need as well. We just uh, ignore it. And the rest we can just define if you want to have uh, force a refresh from the back end or if you want to use the cached version if it's available. So let's, let's start that and, and see what happens in our application. There you go. Compiling and installing. Compiling and installing. It sometimes takes a little while because we use the wireless wow. network and it's a little bit unstable. Oh, okay, cool. But see what we have now. We have navigation here. So we have used the semantic zoom control, and we can just navigate through the application now. Uh, what you might now notice now is that <clears throat> different to the demo before, you don't see any images, right? Uh, that's on purpose, because we don't want to really store the images on our, on our device. We want to get the images from SharePoint. Uh, and no, I should switch back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so we want to get the images back from SharePoint, because SharePoint should really manage all our resources which we want to show in our application. Because it could be that somebody is adding new navigation entries, and then we don't want to update our app. So we want to get the images back from our app, or from SharePoint directly. The way to do that is to use uh, something called properties in the term store. So in your navigation term store, you, have, you can define custom properties, which you can return back from SharePoint into your application. In the slide here, you see they are called local properties. You, what you can do is just define a key. So for, in our example, we say it, it's an F image. And we define a URL <coughs> to the category image. And then we also have something called a, or added something called sys facet full refinement string. What is this, Manfred? That's an interesting one. <clears throat> there are some system properties in the navigation term store. And one of them is called, as here, written here, sys facet full refinement string. This one is returning the uh, contextual refiners on a certain category. So if I'm, for example, into in uh, laptops, it will tell me which navigators I have to actually fetch from search. So this is really the, the combination between navigation and search. OK, so this will right. give you both the, the menu structure and also the uh, contextual refiner for each category. Yeah, let's have a look at what it gives back. So if I do this request again, and I have highlighted the, the interesting part here, I get back the nav, nav image as a property in the property back. And it specifies which, you, uh, which URL I should use for the, for the category images. One interesting thing here is, is the question mark width equals 100. 
And that's really using the feature image re uh, re uh, rendition in SharePoint. So if you have an image which is like 1,024 in size or in width, you can say, I just want to have it back as a, with a width of 100. Sounds useful if you are developing an app both for a, a smartphone with a small real estate and, in this case, a tablet with a bigger real estate, and you would like to have different image sizes, right? Definitely. And we also want to do safe space. We don't really want to send down megabytes of data. So we can really adjust that parameter for our companion apps. And below you see <coughs> it, it returns us which facets we want to return from, ser uh, from search or we need to return to ask for when we do a REST request. In this example, for example, uh, we see that we need to, to get the uh, right price and right brand back. Good. If you want to have some more information about uh, the image uh, redemption, uh, rendition, sorry, then uh, you should look at this session. It's already over, but uh, there are recordings on it. So let's add this custom property and see what happens then. Okay, here it is. So now I just add the custom properties with what you saw before. This string for the facet navigation, the navigation images. And if we compile that again and then start application, what we'll see is that we also get the images back. The facet navigation I'm coming back to later on. We, we don't use them right now, but we'll come back to that. So you can just switch to that. So now it's, it's compiling again, and it's, it's deploying the app on our device. That unfortunately takes a little time. Do you have network issues? Network issues here. I guess you've heard that before, right? Always the scary thing for doing demos. Let me try once more, otherwise I will just start it on this screen. Yep. Because it's a Windows 8 device, I also can actually compile it. I don't have to really deploy it on yes, our, we have an on our Surface device. You're actually been compiling to the real device here, uh, even if you cannot see it, but we, we can also use the emulator. Should be up. Okay, let's go back to the screen and I just do the demo on locally. So I'm switching from a remote to my local machine. I'm using, uh, let's use the release and start it from here. I hope he's not playing tricks on me right now. Oh. Yeah, now it's coming up. Good. Wow. Super. So now you see we have the images in place, and we can use the semantic zoom to, to drive into the categories. <laughs> now this stuff is still empty here. So let's go back to that. So the next thing we want to do is to actually fill the categories. So if we click into one of the main categories or subcategories, we want to get the items back. We call that product category search. Uh, to do that, I would like to explain you a little bit more on how uh, search-driven sites and product catalogs actually work together with, with navigation. So on the left side here, you see that uh, edit screen of uh, one product item. And on the bottom there, you see something called an item category. This item category is bound to the taxonomy term store into the product hierarchy. So you can basically tag any product item anywhere in the hierarchy and move it around like that, right? And what we want to do is basically get out all the items which are tagged with laptops. So if you index that item, and the naming I'm using here can be wrong because it, it depends on how you actually map the crawl properties to manage properties, and there are other sessions on that. But you can imagine you have, in this, this case, we have a managed property called product catalog item category, and it's indexed with the term item, with the term GUID from the navigation, actually. 
And if you do look back to the node state again, at some point you saw there was a GUID in there. So what we now have is to have, we have two term GUIDs which are equal in the navigation and in search. So what we, what we have to do now is basically combine them if we search. <clears throat> so basic query we already saw. But what we will do now is use this manage property, dash, and then the GUID. And in this case here, you also see a, a, a hash mark in front of the GUID. That really indicates that I also want to have all sub item, uh, subcategories from this current category. If I don't have the dash, I only get laptops. If I, if I have the dash and I have a subcategory in the, in the taxonomy, I also get them back. That's what we want to do here. Then in addition, you also want to get to define which selected properties you want to have returned from search. Because by default, you get a set, but you might not have included your properties you want to display on your screen. For example, by default, you might not back get the price. And then you have to define here, I also want to get back the price from search. And the last one, we also want to have the refiners back. And the refiners we saw before in the navigation example, we got the, we call it contextual, on a, contextual refiners. We get this string back from navigation. We don't really have to care what is, what's in this string. We just have to send that into search again. So we have to take that, that string from the navigation and put it into this refiner property. If we combine that all together, switch again. So I'm going to add some code here. And you don't want to see me typing, I'm sure. So I'm just putting in uh, some code here. And we will walk through it. So basically, in this method, we get in uh, the, the current catalog category. So if you navigate around, we keep that as state in our application. So if you move into, into, into laptops, I get laptop, the laptop node into this method. That really defines me which category I'm in. And then I'm building up this query string here. So in our case, the managed property is some, some weird name. But we use the managed property, dash, hash, and the category ID, which we get passed in here. So that's what we really search in here. And all this information, you basically got back from the navigation structure, right? Yes. Yep. And then we also get the refinement string. This one is really coming back from navigation. We don't have to care how it looks. So if you take the navigation or the, the values, which is called assess underscore nav uh, full string something, and just add that to the refiner's properties. And also we have to pass in, if you already apply a, a refiner, we have to pass in which refiners we have applied. Because you can apply multiple refiners. You can, for example, have a, for example say, I, have a, I want to have a red laptop in a certain price segment. And we have to pass that into search so we actually get only the, the results back for that. Good, and then let us start the application again. And what we will see here now is basically we have a full-fledged uh, search experience. We have now the navigation. We can drill into a category. We get items for, for, for certain categories, and we get the facets. Wow, that's only two calls. And basically two calls. almost got everything you need for your application. That's correct. So now we have the facets here on the left side, and we have all the items here. Actually, we also can already drill into this uh, item because we don't do an additional search. In the first search, we also get the items which we need to uh, display, for example, description, specifications, overview. So we have basically everything in place. And these are all managed properties, right? Crawl, crawl properties mapped to managed properties. And as yes. long as you know the name, you can get anything out. That's it. And this is basically what you mean by search-driven user interfaces, search-driven content, content by search. So here, for example, that's an HTML snippet, which we just indexed. You can mark uh, the product catalog uh, and columns that you should not strip HTML out, for example. And we can just use that again. Good. But now we have here some item recommendations. That's something we also want to, to have, right? So let's now look back to, <clears throat> to analytic search. Uh, I was mentioning before, analytics is a huge area. 
uh, currently in, in 2013, you can integrate with Facebook. It's really powerful. Uh, for sake of simplicity, we decided to just look at two examples. One of them is, is most popular searches based on views. So if somebody views a product, it, get, it gets a, a certain count. Depending on the spread of, uh, of people viewing this item, it gets higher up in the stack. And then also item to item recommendations. Bruno, do you want to tell a little bit about recommendations? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you can also hook up um, um, your custom events here. Uh, it depends entirely upon your, your application, really. So, but you, you, a typical example in this case would be that you basically offer an opportunity for your customers or your users to log on to Facebook with their Facebook ID. And as long as you have an, a Facebook application identifier, you can actually tap into their profile, if you like. Or you can just track Facebook likes. But then if you feed that, that information back uh, to, to uh, the analytics engine through an event stream, the, uh, the analytics engine is then able to do item to item recommendations for you. So you, you get all that for free. And the only thing you have to do is register your customer event, and you can have up to 12 of those. Make sure that you feed the events back to the search service. We have a separate uh, API for that. And then you can search for recommendations by the recommendation for uh, managed property. And we also had a session on Tuesday. You might want to watch the recording on that one to see it. So this, these are the two uh, examples we're going to show today. Uh, Rune mentioned you can just use the managed property called recommended for, and you pass in the item ID you want to have recommendations for, and then basically you're done. You get recommended items. As easy as that. For most popular searches, you can just, uh, in this case, we limit the, the content to a certain group of, of, of items. Do not really include all the pages on your site. So we just say the content type of the catalog limited to the catalog, and we, we sort the, the re result with the views recent property in a descending order. Uh, all the details about that can be really... Uh, it's all available it's posted, on the web, right? Yeah. yeah. Everything is so, documented on the web. So let's, let's do item recommendations then. So as Manfred prepares there, basically, recommendation is nothing less than a, another search where you just specify recommended for attributes uh, or do sorting. So here again, uh, it's pretty similar to what we did before. We, in this method, we have the possibility to switch between recommended for and most popular searches. In the recommended for, we again just uh, construct a query which looks like that. So we get the item ID passed into the method. And for uh, the most popular search, we just set a, a sort list or the sort parameter of the, rest in, of the rest request. We set it to this views recent and then this descending order and limit it to a certain set of results. And doing that really gives us now two things on our, new, on our application. The first thing you will see is the most popular on the left side of the application, which we put onto the home screen, but you can place it place it wherever you want because of real estate on this uh, smaller screens on the pads we decided to do that and if you drill into an item you will get item to item recommendations oh see there popular items so you see we have now popular items on the on the left side and let's go to laptops and uh, drill into one of this first one here and here we have item recommendations it's quick huh? actually what so, you saw here when we open this page, we issue a, a, a search query. It's that quick. And this is really important. This is the reason why we don't use uh, atom feeds, but return uh, strongly typed um, custom types directly to you. Good. So the next thing, we also want to instrument the analytics in, from our app. In, uh, in the web page, it's done automatically. If you use a CBS web part, for example, in our application, we have to do that part manually. So we have to send in some usage events uh, to an analytics engine. This is the only call we have to do post, and that's just, uh, just how it is. 
but it, it's an easy post event, right? You have just to specify the usage, uh, usage entry. You have to give it an uh, event type ID, which again is, uh, you get more information if you read up on analytics. Uh, you have to specify the item ID, which is used for, for the algorithm, but usually you use the same item ID as you use in your catalog. Uh, you can pass in the site to limit these recommendations only for a certain site collection, for example, and you can even scope it down to have just a sub, uh, sub-site. And you have to give him some uh, user identification, and that's, that's very important. I think that's the most import, uh, important part in, in this uh, arrest call. Mm. Uh, this user ID has to be unique. For analytics to be able to actually get patterns, we have to have a, a unique user ID. That doesn't mean we have to have a user ID from SharePoint. It can be basically anything as long as it's unique. So you can basically just, when you start up your application, generate a uh, GUID, store it in your application, and use that going forward. Uh, it makes sense to have at least the, the same user ID for a session. You can even change it if you start up that again. doesn't really matter. As long as you have unique entries from different users, we are all good. Yeah. And it, this also works in anonymous scenarios where you actually don't know the user. You just have to create something unique for that session. The important thing is that recommendations engine or the analytics engine uh, needs a unique identifier to track all the events from that user, which we use to identify experts, which again identify what items to recommend. When, when you view something. Good, now let's look at the event, event logging. So in our, in our case, we just used the hardware ID uh, from the device to, to generate a, a unique ID. And then we send in this as part of the user ID. All the, the, the rest here is really just the, the site GUID, which we also get from navigation, and the item ID, which is the item ID from the product we're looking at. And there is really not much I want to show you here in detail, because you, basically you don't see anything in your application which is happening, right? It's everything in the background. You basically do a, a post request, but the user doesn't really notice. You could, if you want to see that what's really happening, you can use Fiddler, for example, but I'm not, not going to going to go into that. So there is, it doesn't make sense to actually start that, that application right now. OK. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, Manfred, um, when we created this uh, Contos Electronics uh, Superstore webfront, um, we also used editorial control uh, to um, give promotions. Right. So I actually have already created a query rule. Query rule. Uh, I will not go into details of how I set up that because we have a dedicated deep dive session on query rule, but I did it. Uh, so I will show you how it works. So it was actually one of the phones. I gave a discount for that uh, and promoted it. So let's, uh, let's have a look on the website how that looks like. So here we have the website again. I can go to com. Uh, no, it was uh, phones. And go into mobile phones. And we should see, yeah, here we see it. The special deal. This is a query rule. I haven't seen you have the support for that in your application yet. Can you do that? That's right. Yes, of course we can do that. Let's see how we can do that. Uh, I'm not going to go to explain on how query rules really work because that's again a big thing. What we really, what I want to man or say here is that we have to make sure in our client application that the, uh, the rule is triggered. So we have to know which ru or query rules triggering mechanisms we're using in our web front end. In, in this case, we are using the, the, the term ID and term set ID of the category. So we basically say we want to have a promotion on, in a certain category for a certain item. To trigger that, we, we, do, we do it with the term ID and the term set ID. Yeah, basically, that's what I did in the, in, in the query rule. I right. just gave the search engine uh, a command to send back some additional information uh, for this product and put it on the top of a search result. That was all I did. And you have to pick up that information, right? Yep. <clears throat> So, because we know now that we, we match on the term ID and the term set ID, we basically just have to pass that, that part into part of, the, of our REST query. And to, to do that, we can use something called properties. So we can set a property value with the term ID and dash and then our category ID. 
If you do not that, we should really get now the recommendations back the same way as we do in, in the web application. So all you needed to know was what I actually, the name of the property I sent in? Yes. Okay. Let's go to so mobile phones now. Mobile phones, it was right. Yeah. Oh, yes. there you go. Now here it is. Top of the search results. Thank you. I guess we're going to sell a lot of those. Yep. Good. I mean, that, that was really the application by itself. You, you have seen now, we have built up a companion app with, with a few simple queries. I think it's just important that you understand how navigation works together with, with search, how you can use analytics, and how to use it right. And if you do that, you can build your, your companion app in a very, very simple way. Uh, the REST interface is extremely powerful, we think. And you can do a lot more than what we have shown you here. You can use different properties. You can use analytics properties. You can use... Uh, uh, synonyms. So basically just have a go look at the REST interface and, and all the properties you can set and start playing with it. Absolutely. So that was the application. There's a couple of things to know uh, that I think is important for you to know as well if you're going to develop these kind of applications. As I said, these are search results and we're using it directly, implicitly into the user experience. So we need it to be quick. Uh, and for that we have a couple of tricks for you. So. Uh, when I used it in the browser, made a REST call in the begin beginning of the session, uh, I got XML back. That's the default. But I can also get JSON back. That actually saves you 10% payload uh, just by adding the accept header application JSON. Now, you also have to add all data verbose here. The reason for that is we are using a pretty fresh version of all data, and we are also going to give an even more efficient version of all data later when that comes, uh, comes around. Uh, in the meantime, you have to use this all data verbals. When that improvement comes, you should see this dropping even further, maybe 70, 80 percent smaller even. Uh, in addition to that, request only, as, Ma as Manfred did, request only the managed properties you need in your, in your application. Because by default, I think you'll get back 40 or 50 default managed properties in your search results. And if you don't need all of those, just reduce it to the ones you need, and that will save you a lot of, of um, bandwidth as well. In order to do that, you have to use bypass result types equals true, and then you have to just use the select properties parameters of the search interface. If you do that, you will get it reduced. In addition, we also support compression uh, by default with SharePoint 2013. So just add accept encoding, gzip or deflate, any of your choosing or both, um, and you will get a compressed result back to you. By using these, you're basically reducing the payload by 90%. And that can make a big difference. And if you're on a metered connection, like you are on a smartphone, that can be a big deal for your customers as well. Also optimize for fluid user interfaces. As you can have seen in, in Manfred's uh, code, um, he cached uh, on the client side. Now, that sample code we will make uh, available for, uh, for you shortly. Uh, but so it's not about the performance of the search APIs itself because as you saw they're quite performant I mean we're talking about a couple of hundred milliseconds here uh, it's about network connections itself so you might have we're talking about internet here on smartphones and tablets so it can be a little bit glitchy so having caching protects you against that and lastly really adopt the new asynchronous patterns as you can have seen from Windows Phone uh, 7.5 and 8 and in Windows 8 uh, with, uh, in C Sharp, we saw here uh, async await. This makes the user interface responding, even though we are doing back, uh, um, back end requests and calls to SharePoint. Lastly, we are also going to share with you um, uh, another sample called SearchPad. This is uh, an, um, a sample we made uh, that is um, in, um, inspired by uh, Fiddler. Uh, it allows you to enter search results and really explore what's going on down on the wire. So let's have a look at that. So I hope you can see this. I might be a little bit small, but basically what I have done here, I've told this, this tool here, and we will release it with the source code so you can have a look at it. Basically, I tell it the SharePoint endpoint, and I tell it to return JSON. I turn off authentication, and I'm telling it to use the anonymous 
uh, template. I can, also, of course, also authenticate and use it internally. And then, basically, I just fill in a, a property query text here, M400, and I submit the query. And as you can see here, basically, we, are, we now can look into what's going on on the wire. Um, this is an HTTP, HTTP GET request. Uh, you can see the JSON header here, or you can browse, uh, browse the headers. And down at the bottom, we get the raw results, if you would like to explore that one. Uh, tap into the headers that you get for, back from SharePoint. Uh, and this is where you can see how this compression and play with the compression. I haven't turned it on here, but you can play with that as well. And we have a JSON uh, explorer here as well, so we, you can just look at all the search results. We give you statistics, so you can look at that. And you can play with select properties and really reduce the payload size uh, that goes, goes over the wire. And you can then, of course, browse the search results. And as you see, we have primary query here. This is also a good opportunity to tell you what is this secondary query thing. Now, primary queries is what you get uh, is the result you get back, uh, mainly when you when you um, issue a, your search query. But we have this query rules thing, and query rules may add something to your normal search results, but query rules may also uh, execute additional queries with additional results. Um, and if you know um, the search object model from SharePoint, this uh, result table collection. Uh, everything here is the same thing. You just have deco um, put them together in, um, so you know which result tables belongs together. So every result table you get back that belongs to a particular search query comes in the secondary query results. And that's, that makes it very easy for you as a developer to navigate to the result table you want without you have to look into these different GUIDs and user IDs and everything to, um, to identify your, your correct result table. As you can see here, we have a query, and you can have multiple query results there. And here we have some custom results. And in this case, uh, this is actually a um, um, table of personal favorite results, if we get back. OK, so that's, that's, um, that's the search pad. We can switch back again. OK, so let's recap here a little bit. So here we have seen SharePoint <coughs> search. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you scared me. Really sorry. <laughs> we have seen the SharePoint search REST APIs. And it's more than one. It's, of course, the search query API, which has a lot of power. And we have only explored a couple of them. In addition to that, we have the navigation REST APIs, which is basically what gives you the managed navigations back and how that connects to search results. We have also seen how we can use the same search API to get back recommendations by two different ways, one by sorting and another way by using the recommended for managed property. And lastly, even though we haven't seen it executing, because basically it's a post and there's no UI to it, we also use the user event logging. Um, which is important to give feedback to the analytics uh, engine in SharePoint to really be able to calculate the recommended items for, your, your, for you and your customers. We have seen the companion app. And uh, yeah, well, it runs here. Uh, we might even uh, show it a little bit more. You have, uh, you, I think you have the final application there. So you can browse through it again if you want to. Uh, OK, yeah, we lost connection. I'm sorry for that. We also saw how we actually reuse content. All the content we saw in the device application is the same content that drives that uh, SharePoint website. Um, as long as you get it into the index, you can share it with everybody. And again, also, here I yep. think we, it's important to notice it's really not only about uh, catalog and public facing sites. You can also cover your internet scenarios. You might have a news feed, or you might actually connect news, feed, news feeds from different site collections and put that together and, and expose that in your companion app. That's also a scenario which you could think of, right? We have been using the public-facing website and the catalog because it's, it's a nice showing. It's easy to show. Everybody understands it. It's nice images. But you can really use it for anything which is search-driven sites or which uses search as the driver, which can be a news federation application. Uh, you make it up, right? Or line of business applications. And we do support all the authentication regimes, as you see in SharePoint 2013. I mean, forms-based. Uh, uh, cookies, what have you, uh, like uh, OAuth, it's all there, even though now we just explore the anonymous part of it. And we also saw how we could reuse the navigation, which is in the taxonomy terms store. 
Lastly, we did a trick with, uh, with uh, query rules, which I already made. I cheated a little bit there, and gave you promotions. Uh, and you can see that it's the same promotion that it's now showing on your public-facing website as it is showing on your Surface RT application. And here also, you could, for example, think of scenarios where you want to have only certain query rules triggered for your device. That's completely doable because you basically can tap in into the capabilities of your device. You have location, for example, as a part of it. So you can take out the locations and tap back with search and just make a query rules which actually triggers for certain devices. For example, just for iPads, only for surfaces, or only for, for companion apps in general, but not really show that on the UI. So you're extremely flexible on, on mixing and matching there. And trying to take a step back here to really see what this can be used for. Basically, what we are doing now is we are turning SharePoint into a business management tool, where you are actually managing the user experience both on your SharePoint sites and on devices. Because when I change anything inside SharePoint in the search results, adding a query rule, all those millions of customers out there with their, with their phones or their tablets or what have you will automatically be updated and take part in that new user experience whenever you wanted to. Um, because they, they basically execute search queries. So we have a couple of hands-on labs that we think is uh, interesting. Uh, in the context of this REST API. I don't think there is any of this that really taps into the REST API, but it shows you uh, how you can use the SharePoint features to get content into the search index and how to get it out again. And how to build a product-centric site, for instance, teaches you the, t the things you need to know in order to build that Contoso Electronic Super site. Introduction to Search tells you a little bit about the same thing we have used there. Uh, and exploring search query rules. It's really where the power is when it comes to moderation and editorial control. And these are sessions. Most of them have been, uh, have been done already. And we had a, a parallel session to this one, uh, Grow Your Business Online with SharePoint Adaptive Experiences. That shows, uh, really goes into depth about that public-facing website. And we have gone into depth about how to use the search API to, to build companion apps. Uh, but you might want to watch the recordings here later on. And lastly, don't forget to give us those great scores. I mean, um, you have heard this before, right? That uh, the number five is, really means OK, doesn't it? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, in case you don't like it, come and talk to us before you give us that eval. And if you really liked it, give us those fives, because we really love those fives. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thanks I really hope you enjoyed it. And then we are open for questioning.